Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Allison Howie, and I'm a clinical research assistant at the University of Western Ontario and a research coordinator at the University of Ottawa. I'm delighted to be speaking to you today about how to measure the degree of pragmatism of randomized controlled trials using PreC2 and our plans for developing PreC3. Earlier today, my colleagues provided an introduction to pragmatic randomized trials. And in my presentation, I'll be discussing the design of randomized trials, specifically using the PreC tool. So PreC stands for the Pragmatic Explanatory Continuum Indicator Summary Tool. And the original version of the tool was published in 2009 with an updated version named PreC2 in 2015. So the overall aim of the tool is to help researchers design trials that are fit for purpose. In other words, to make sure that their trial is set up adequately to answer the questions that they're interested in. So researchers are encouraged to use the tool prospectively when designing their trial, as it forces them to think closely about each design decision that they make and the implications that these choices have on their resulting trial. So as you can see in the diagram here, the tool consists of nine design domains, each scored on a scale from one very explanatory to five very pragmatic. The idea is that a fully pragmatic trial scoring five on all, five, on all nine domains would fill the entire circle, whereas a fully explanatory trial scoring one on all domains um, would generate a small circle at the center of the wheel. And then a mixed trial with both pragmatic and explanatory design elements would look more like a web. So on the PreC2 website at preC2.org, you can input the trial information for each of the nine design domains and a wheel will be generated for you. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna go through each of the nine design domains in detail using a large cluster randomized trial as an example. And the trial I selected is the Ontario Printed Educational Materials Diabetes Trial that was conducted a number of years ago in Ontario, Canada. So there were two levels of participants in the trial, the physician practices, which were, made, which were the clusters and their individual patients who were individuals over 65 with diabetes in Ontario. The intervention was a printed educational material that was mailed to physicians to recommend increasing prescriptions for diabetes care. And there were two versions of the PEM, um, both a short version and a long version were tested. The comparator arm was usual care. And at the time of the trial, there were no educational or other interventions in routine care aimed at improving um, prescribing for diabetes. The primary outcome was the intensification of prescriptions for diabetes care. And as mentioned, the trial took place a number of years ago in 2005, and follow-up occurred using routinely collected prescribing data. Um, and the trial was designed as a two by two factorial cluster randomized trial to be able to test um, the two separate versions of the intervention at once. So the first design domain is eligibility. And the key question to think about is, is everyone included in the trial that would be eligible to receive the intervention in routine care? Um, a more pragmatic trial would have broad inclusion criteria and few exclusion criteria, whereas a more explanatory trial might exclude difficult participants. Um, historically, pregnant women, children, and the elderly have been excluded from trials. Um, but if these groups would be eligible to receive the intervention in routine care, then excluding them in the trial would, re would result in a more um, explanatory trial. Um, in the OPUM trial, um, we have to look at eligibility on two separate levels, both at the cluster level and at the individual patient level. So in terms of the clusters, the physician practices, almost all fee-for-service um, family practices were included in the trial. And at the time of the study, most physicians um, were compensated using this um, payment model. So it did account for the majority of family physicians. Um, and in terms of patients, almost all individuals over 65 years with type one and type two diabetes in Ontario, Canada were included. Um, but we have to note that the, the intervention was targeted at those over 50. Um, but the administrative databases that were used to conduct the trial only had prescribing data available for patients over 65. 
And so while a large population was included in the trial, um, some participants were excluded, um, particularly those from the age of 50 to 65. And so this resulted in a slightly more explanatory design decision. So um, it resulted in a score of four instead of five. The second domain is recruitment. And the key question to think about here is, are there intensive recruitment efforts to identify eligible patients beyond what would be feasible in the particular setting? And settings um, include uh, clinics, schools, communities. Um, in a more pragmatic trial, um, they would recruit in usual care in multiple settings um, or have universal recruitment via administrative databases where no contact with the participants is actually required. A more explanatory choice would be to provide funding or incentives for participation in the trial. In the real world, um, if a provider wanted to wanted their patient to trial a new drug, they of course wouldn't be paid for this. And so using incentives to recruit deviates from usual care and would make the trial more explanatory. Using media advertising campaigns to recruit a larger group of individuals would also render the trial more explanatory as these individuals likely wouldn't be aware of the intervention in, if it were to be rolled out in the real world. In the OPUM trial, um, both physicians and patients were identified from administrative databases. There was no contact at all with either groups. Everyone who met the eligibility criteria was automatically enrolled. So this was highly pragmatic and received a score of five. The third domain is setting. And the question to think about here is, is the trial conducted in a similar setting to which the results are intended to be implied? And this is taking into account things like geography, healthcare system, socioeconomic and ethnic mix of the population. Um, in a pragmatic trial, it would be conducted in usual care settings at a large number of centers. Um, a more explanatory choice would be to conduct the trial at very specific settings, such as academic hospitals or specialist care centers, when the results are actually intended to be applied more broadly across the population. Also using single or very small number of centers is um, an explanatory approach as well. So in the OPUM trial, primary care physician practices across Ontario, Canada were included. There were no exclusions based on geography, staffing levels, or patient populations. Um, this included diverse practices across Northern and Southern Ontario, including um, rural and urban communities as well. Um, so the setting was um, exactly the same as if it were to be replied in the real world. And so this um, was very highly pragmatic and scored a five. The fourth domain is organization. And the key question to think about here is by how much do the expertise and resources needed for the trial deviate from usual care? In a pragmatic trial, the intervention would be inserted into the usual organization of care making use of no more than existing staff and resources. In an explanatory trial, there might be extensive training um, provided to the intervention deliverers um, or require that a certain level of experience or expertise is needed to um, deliver the intervention. And something that we see quite commonly is that um, study staff are available for guidance throughout the trial. So once the intervention is rolled out in the real world, of course, these study staff wouldn't be available for support. And so this makes the trial less pragmatic. In the OPUM trial, there were no extra staff or training required to deliver the intervention. It was very unobtrusive and feasible to do unchanged in the usual Ontario setting, of course, provided that um, the ministry would be willing to mail out the intervention. But considering the low cost of mailing these papers, um, it does seem quite feasible in the Ontario setting. And so um, this was a very pragmatic choice and again, scored a five. The fifth domain is flexibility of delivery. And the key question to consider is, does the trial allow for providers to decide how they will implement the intervention? In a more pragmatic trial, the details of how to implement the intervention are left up to the provider. Uh, you know, they're able to deliver it exactly as they would in routine care. But a more explanatory approach would be to provide detailed instructions on how to implement the intervention. 
or to restrict what other co-interventions are permitted throughout the trial period. In the OPOM trial, the intervention provided guidelines on prescribing, but these weren't mandatory to follow and the decision of whether to change their prescribing was ultimately left to the physician. There are also no specific instructions sorry, on how, to, how and when to discuss the medications with the patients. So physicians really had full flexibility in how they chose to deliver the intervention. And so this, um, again, was quite pragmatic and scored a five. The sixth domain is flexibility of adherence. And the question to think about here is, are there measures in place to ensure that participants adhere to the intervention? In a pragmatic trial, there would be full flexibility in how the end user recipients engage with the intervention with no special measures to enforce compliance. A more explanatory approach would be to have measures in place to both monitor and address poor compliance. For example, say the providers in the trial ask their patients to bring in their blister packs and medications to clinic visits, and the provider checks if the patient took the meds as prescribed. And then those who didn't take the meds um, as prescribed are no longer able to receive the intervention or are removed from the trial. In the OPAM trial, um, there are no measures in place to monitor whether physicians received, opened, or read the intervention. They had full flexibility in deciding what they wanted to do with the recommendations they received. So this uh, was highly pragmatic and again, scored a five. The seventh domain is follow-up. And the question to consider here is who is conducting the follow-up and how frequently? and is additional information being collected that is not used in the analysis. A more pragmatic trial would have no more follow-up than would occur in routine care or have trial outcomes obtained by other means, such as electronic medical records or administrative data. In a more explanatory trial, there might be frequent and lengthy follow-up visits or extensive data collection um, beyond what is really necessary for the trial outcome, for measuring the trial outcomes. In the OPAM trial, um, follow-up occurred one year post-intervention mail-out um, by means of administrative databases. So there was no contact at all with the individual physicians or patients to determine um, the trial outcomes. They just simply used information that was already available in the province. Um, so this was highly pragmatic. No extra information was collected. Um, so this uh, scored a five as well. The eighth domain is primary outcome. And the key question to consider is to what extent is the primary outcome relevant and important to participants, care deliverers, and external stakeholders? In a pragmatic trial, the, the primary outcome would be of obvious importance to patients. Uh, you know, patients are often more um, interested in outcomes like symptoms that they can see or notice a difference in um, compared to things like lab values. Um, and also a pragmatic decision would be to have outcomes assessed on criteria that are widely used in routine care. A more explanatory trial would have central or might have central adjudication of the outcome measurement. Um, this is when a study team meets with providers across a range of specialties or disciplines to decide whether a participant experienced the primary outcome as per the trial standard. Also pragmatic um, would be to have a composite or sorry, explanatory would be to have a composite outcome in which some of the outcomes are relevant to patients, but not all of them. In the OPAM trial, the primary outcome was behavior change among physicians. Um, and this was manifested through intensification of prescription of diabetes medications. Um, and this outcome is likely more important to physicians as compared to patients who are probably more interested in alleviating or reducing complications such as cardiovascular disease. And so for this reason, since the outcome wasn't entirely important to patients, um, we did lower the score to a three. It was still quite relevant to prescribers, but just not as relevant to the patients themselves. And so um, it was more in the middle of the pragmatic explanatory continuum. The final domain is primary analysis. And the question to think about here is was the analysis conducted appropriately in a way that included most, if not all, participants in the trial? 
A more pragmatic trial would have an intention to treat analysis using all available data. And if there were missing data, they would have methods to address this, such as multiple imputation. A more explanatory approach would be to have a per protocol analysis where non-compliant um, participants are excluded. In the OPUM trial, an intention to treat analysis was carried out um, and there were no patients or physicians lost to follow up because we used administrative data um, to conduct these outcome assessments. So um, this again was highly pragmatic. So this is what the completed PRECI tool wheel looks like for the OPUM trial. As you can see from the diagram, um, it's quite clear where or which domains are less pragmatic, the eligibility and the primary outcome. Um, so if you're in the design phase of a trial, you may discuss whether it's possible to make changes to the eligibility and primary outcome domains to make the trial more pragmatic if that was in fact your intention. Um, if not in the case, as in the case of the OPUM trial, it's important to recognize where you fall short in terms of designing your pragmatic trial and to address these as limitations when presenting your findings. And just as a reminder, these wheels can be generated at no cost at preC2.org. So since PreC2 was published in 2015, there have been nearly 500 citations of the article. Of these, about 100 were protocols for randomized controlled trials and 66 were primary reports of these randomized trials. Um, and a considerable proportion of these studies included PreC2 tables or wheels in their published manuscript, um, which allows readers of the paper to um, see exactly how they designed the trial and where um, and which domains were more pragmatic or more explanatory. Um, and the remaining uh, 380 articles were things like methods papers, systematic reviews, editorials, um, opinion letters, etc. So in our preliminary findings so far in looking at these 486 citations, we found that around 75 of these publications included comments, criticisms, or suggestions for improving the PreC2 tool. And just as a disclaimer, these results are preliminary and haven't yet been double checked, and so they shouldn't be relied on or referred to. So moving towards PreC3, um, considering the comments in the literature, we have assembled an international group of researchers to prepare an update of the tool, taking into these, uh, taking into account these um, published comments, criticisms, and suggestions for improvement. And our tentative plan is to conduct a systematic review, which, as I mentioned, is currently underway, um, followed by a Delphi, sur Del Delphi survey. Um, to decide which elements to include in the updated version of the tool and followed by a reliability study. And some of the things that we're considering including in the update so far are the choice of comparator, um, including things like blending and placebos, and also including some guidelines for scoring cluster randomized trials like the OPUM trial. Uh, neither the original PreC article or the PreC2 tool provide guidelines on how to score a cluster trial on multiple levels. Um, and so with the rise in cluster trials today, we think it's um, quite important to provide guidance on this going forward. So that concludes my presentation today. Thank you so much for listening. And if you have any questions, please feel free to, feel free to reach out to me at ahowie5 at uwo.ca. Thanks so much.